securing their access to Swedish iron ore, essential for the German war machine, the Wehrmacht invaded and occupied Denmark and Norway, and had plans to do the same to Iceland. It turned out to be crucial for the coming battle of the Atlantic against the German submarines that the Brits and later the Americans secured naval and air bases in Iceland. In the words of Josef Lunds, later Secretary General of NATO, Iceland is a floating air carrier from the decks of which a military power can keep control of the North Atlantic and hence the transportation lanes between Europe and America. This preemptive action turned out to be crucial for the safety of US convoys, bringing men and materiel from the arsenal of democracy, as Roosevelt called it, first to the Russians on the Eastern Front, and later for the invasion of Normandy to establish the Western Front. So, let us not forget that during the initial phase of the Second World War, we, the Nordics, and the Baltic nations shared a common experience. We were all small nations, hoping to be left alone behind futile <coughs> declarations of neutrality, while we were, in fact, helplessly at the mercy of militarized dictatorships, hell-bent on world domination by military force. The difference is that after the war, we, the Nordics, got a second chance, whereas you on the Baltic Ring, by an accidental geographical location, did not. Denmark, Norway and Iceland learned their lessons from the war and became founding members of NATO in 1949. You, on the other hand, had to wait almost half a century for the consequences of the Second World War to be disentangled and renegotiated. You had to learn your lessons on the imperative of collective security for small nations the hard way. After restoring independence in 91, you have left no one in doubt that those lessons are not forgotten. All of those lessons have lingered on in our collective memory. They came to the surface once again when the Soviet Empire started to show some visible signs of internal decay and outward decline. Then I'm asked, was it difficult? Was it a difficult decision for Iceland to step forward actively to support your struggle in 89-91, while others remained aloof, uh, some of them quite reluctant to incur the wrath of the Russian bear? In answering this question, I want to make two comments. First, this one. If the leaders of the democratic West had embraced the representatives of the peaceful democratic Baltic way to freedom and welcomed them into the ranks of the democratic forces, there would have been no need for Iceland or for any other small nation to do anything in particular we would just have done what small nations <coughs> normally are expected to do, follow the leader. But this is not at all what happened. Why? The Secretary General of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, had become a popular cult figure in the West. In the name of Glasnost and Perestroika, his political landmark, trademark, he was uh, presented as the leader of a democratic reform movement within the USSR. He is a man with whom we can do business, as Margaret Thatcher famously said. Nothing should be said or done, was the mantra, to undermine Mr. Gorbachev's position, lest the hardliners, the bad guys, who take over again and turn the clock back to the bad old days. I, Sorry, I apologize for having forgotten this thing. It's Nokia, by the way. <laughs> Moreover, Mr. Bush Sr., Papa Bush, wanted the Russians as allies in his planned invasion of Iraq in January 1990, or at least he wanted them uh, not to stand in the way. Chancellor Cole, 
and Foreign Minister Genser have one overriding aim, and understandably so, to the exclusion of all others, the peaceful reunification of Germany. Anything that might put this overriding aim at risk was by definition bad. They felt that in achieving German reunification, they were wholly dependent upon Gorbachev's goodwill. Were he to be replaced by the hardliners, the whole process of ending the Cold War, unifying Germany, ending Red Army occupation in Central and Eastern Europe, and bringing disarmament negotiations to a successful conclusion, all of this could be endangered. The Cold War might even, in the worst case scenario, turn into a hot war again. So, at the time, many of the political leaders, realistically, realized that the stakes were high. In this context, the emerging independence movements in the Baltic states were received by many in the West as if they were awkward intruders into an amiable fraternity of superpowers. They were told in hushed voices not to disturb the peace and urged to settle for a compromise with their colonial masters. They were even denied access to conferences where the leaders of East and West were belatedly trying to deal with the consequences of the Second World War in Eastern Europe. Uh, at a conference, for instance, in Copenhagen on June 6, 1990, on human rights, held within the framework of the GSE process, the Baltic foreign ministers uh, arrived on the scene, wanting to plead their case, but were turned away. In Paris, a few months later, at the conference of the European Charter, the basic uh, document declaration of principles for the uh, resettlement of the consequences of the Second World War, uh, they arrived again. They were invited by Foreign Minister Dumas, but uh, when it came to, the, to entering, they were not let in because the Soviets threatened to storm out and wreck the whole process. If the Baltic leaders were shown any token of approval. <coughs> so, my conclusion at that time was this. When political expediency or the mutual self-interest of the high and mighty of this world prevails in such a way over fundamental principles of international law and justice, it is time for small nations to try to give meaning and relevance to the concept of solidarity of small nations. That is why Iceland did what it did. I simply decided to lend my voice to yours, which had been silenced. My second observation is more of a personal nature. I stem from a very political clan in my country. For three generations, we have served in a variety of leading positions within the labor movement and the Social Democratic Party of Iceland. I'm a man of the left. I was for 12 years the leader of the Icelandic Social Democratic Party and a member of the government for eight years in various capacities, Minister of Finance, Foreign Affairs and External Trade. In domestic politics, my party has been the pioneer and the guardian of the Nordic welfare state. But in terms of foreign policy, we have been quite hawkish. We always remember and never forgot the Soviet invasion of Finland in 1939. After the war, we were staunch advocates of Iceland's uh, membership in NATO and the defense agreement with the US. We were fiercely anti-communist. And when it came to issues of European integration, my party is still the only party in Iceland which has advocated Iceland membership in the European Union all the time. And in the years 89-94, I personally led our negotiations with the European Union on the formulation of the European Economic Area, which I considered to be then the first step towards ultimate membership, which has uh, nonetheless been delayed a little bit. Uh, also, on personal notes, it so happens that two of my brothers studied in Eastern Europe. My eldest brother was, as far as I know, the first person from outside the Soviet bloc to graduate from Moscow University and did postgraduate work in Poland. He uh, first came to the Baltic countries in 57 and then uh, from Moscow 
had many friends and, and uh, in, in Moscow at the time and, not, and also in, in Poland. Another brother of mine studied at uh, the Charles University in Prague. Uh, I myself spent a year as a Fulbright scholar at Harvard in 1976-77, where my research theme was comparative economic systems. Already then, I had come to the conclusion that the Soviet-type command economy was hopelessly non-competitive. It could neither deliver the goods for the public in general, nor generate technological innovation. It was mired in stagnation, condemned to defeat in an area of rapid technological and economic change.